chair on behalf of the International Council of Exa Ophthalmology Examinations. Uh, basically, ICO is a Swiss registered charity based in San Francisco, committed to the empowering the ophthalmologists the world over by providing the knowledge and an opportunity to be tested against an international standard. ICO examination division is based in London, and today I have three of my clinical colleagues, two from ICO in London and one from Australia, who will share with you their experience of working in countries where there is a need for ophthalmology. That essentially is at the heart of what ICO does. We provide education, training, uh, organizational skills, leadership skills, and examine ophthalmologists towards an international standard. My colleagues present today are Claire Davy, who is a consultant ophthalmologist in London, who is the deputy director of ICO exams, and in uh, May, on June, shall take over as the director at the World Ophthalmic Congress, which is the main event of ICO organized every two years. I also have Rebecca Fort, who is a consultant in Bristol with an oculoplastic interest, and she has done work in Indonesia, Cambodia, and other countries. Claire has worked in Africa and has led both clinical and leadership programs there. My third colleague is Nitin Verma, who, without giving away my age, has been a close friend and, 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 and a colleague since our days in medical school as an undergraduate, except he just looks younger than me, but we are the same age. And uh, he has done a lot of work in uh, East Timor and Papua New Guinea. He was emphasizing to us yesterday most of his work was in East Timor. He had to get out of PNG. I don't know whether it was because he was threatened by someone with a gun or whether they threatened to eat him for breakfast. But nevertheless, it became incompatible with his safe existence there. So I shall now let the colleagues share with you their experience. And Claire will also cover aspects of ICO examination. Our uh, examination executive, Nicola Quilter, has not been very well, so she hasn't come with us. So it has been left to four of us clinicians to tell you about examination also in some detail. And Claire will cover that. So who's going first? Claire. You know. So I let Claire get started, and she'll tell you about her. That's fine, lovely. Very good. Welcome, everybody, and thanks very much to Aaron for that introduction. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Vision 2020 links programs that are run between the UK and between mostly sub Saharan African countries. Um, one thing that makes me feel that the world has come of age when National Geographic on the front page has as its main leader article that there is the end of blindness. Finally, visual loss and blindness has become a political issue, and that's wonderful. Vision 2020 is about universal eye health, and ensuring that everybody has the, what they need to prevent or cure or rehabilitate vision. Remembering that 82% of blind people are elderly and that the cure and alleviation of blindness contributes to the alleviation of poverty. 
And this is because if you have a blind person in the family, then usually there is a child who's not receiving an education in order to look after the blind person or another adult. And so if you have people who would be economically active not being so, the family is much poorer than it would be. We started the program in 2010. We got a grant from our government, and it's part of East Africa College of Ophthalmologists and the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. So that's now COEXA and the RCOP. And our aims were to improve areas in pediatrics, glaucoma, medical retina, and nursing. We've had many visits, in fact, many more than four, to the UK and many more than four to Uganda. The demographics, it's a little bit like India, but perhaps more so. The mean age is 17 years. Average number of babies per woman is five. And retinoblastomas, they have 80 a year with a population of 36 million. The country is the same size as Britain and only 10% of the population are over the age of 50. Most of the eye conditions can be dealt with at primary level. There are 31 districts and it has one ophthalmic officer and one eye trained nurse in each of the districts. And this gives you an idea about where Uganda is and it's just on the shores of Lake Victoria, squashed between Kenya and the DRC. And these are lessons that we can learn from particularly India. Alleviating blindness is not the same problem as alleviating blindness in India because India is naturally uh, very much more organized. The people expect to work very hard and also well-educated population. So the, the, the issues are different but they're similar, it's worse there. We now have a global action plan to improve vision by 2020. And I recommend anybody to have a look at that, it's the World Health Organization. And it's by health, equitable health education system, more eye doctors, more OCOs, more eye nurses, more eye healthcare workers. We are also involved with the Diabetic Retinopathy Network, which is the DRNet, and we have 15 hospitals, the catchment of 3.8 million with diabetes, and it's supported by the Ministries of Health, and the emphasis is on capacity building. So we, um, the overall uh, rate of diabetes is 2 to 3 percent, which I think here in India you would laugh at, and you'd say, what, only 2 to 3 percent? of the adult population with diabetes, but it is growing faster in sub-Saharan Africa than in anywhere else in the world. They also have a curious type of malnutrition diabetes and a ketone prone diabetes, which is possibly related to cyanide toxicity from cassava. Hypertension is much commoner in sub-Saharan Africa and it's extremely difficult to control. And this, of course, makes all the problems of diabetes much worse. This gives you the sort of percentages around Africa, and you'll see that Uganda has about 1.5% of the adult population with diabetes. There are many systemic reviews which show that of the population surveys, uh, proliferative retinopathy is about 1% of those with diabetes, maculopathy between 3% and uh, other ones come up with similar sorts of uh, figures. So what are the barriers to an effective service? Patients don't attend clinics easily. They don't attend clinics for all sorts of good reasons, is that it's very difficult to get to. They haven't got the cost of the transport. There is a low doctor to patient ratio with short consultation times and no or virtually no patient education. There's a low level of trained nurses and other workers, and there's very little systematic evaluation and monitoring of the complications. Poor records, and we need the national policies to be on board in sub-Saharan Africa. There's also a lack of ophthalmologists and a low number of those with training and experience in diabetes, because a lot of them may have a good ophthalmic education 
but not know how to do a laser. There are few optometrists, and there's very poor and difficult referral from primary to second care, secondary care. And there's a lack of systematic screening. In August, we did a community eye care, and you'll see that I was wearing the same dress there, and it's not the only dress I have in hot countries, but almost. And we are now running community eye clinics, and we're doing an education program to increase the number of community eye clinics so that the difficulties of getting to where the doctors uh, are, to where the patients are who are blind, to the where the doctors are, which is mostly in Kampala. It's a recognized problem by the Department of Health, thank goodness, so we're training them to use the fundus camera, the eye care, arc light, and automated fundus detector. And we're doing a series of clinics this year, three, three of them. And we're training ten to, to cascade the outreach program. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the arc light. This is it. It's directly from the scope. It is a magnifying loop. It has a blue light and it has color detection, visual field, visual field, and it's powered solar. It costs five pounds, and with that we reckon we can populate most of and I can recommend that all trainees and all medical students are equipped with an arc light because it's cheap and it works. <laughs> Sorry? No, it's difficult to get them at the moment. Uh, as As soon as they've made the next batch, it'll come up onto the website. And that's us doing a nice uh, portable camera, arc light, ARC light, yes. Um, lead forward program, we've run uh, three days of workshops, three, three lots of leadership programs, and they was to the nurses and the doctors, eye care workers in Kampala. And they said that it was really useful because they felt much more competent at facilitating meetings and at giving quality improvement, which is really well needed. And this is our first group of uh, doctors and nurses. There is also the ICO Leadership Development Program, which is run by the African Ophthalmological Council and the ICO, American Academy. And in India, it's run by the APAO. Um, and this is here, says what it consists of, but it's basically a two-year program with one day at the APAO, get a self-initiated project, mid-term two to three-day program, and a graduation the following year with presentation of the projects. And that's the website. If you think of one outstanding, fairly young, ophthalmologist who would benefit from this, can I suggest that you um, uh, apply to them on that website because it's a very useful program. Uh, just like to acknowledge the photographer who also runs our program in Uganda, which is Terry Cooper, and there's a couple of his pictures. Thank you all very much, and we're moving on to the next talk, which I hope will happen. And I'm going to talk about the ICO later. Uh, we'll have Nitin Verma who will share with you his experience of having worked in East Timor, where he single-handedly set up the ophthalmic system. And now we expect ICO to provide the examinations to the people who have been trained by Nitin. Right. <laughs> Right. Well, this is not strictly an ICO uh, sort of illustration, but it's an illustration of what's going on and now uh, the program having reached a level of maturity uh, requires the uh, 
uh, offices or the good offices of organizations like the ISO. But really, it's just a story which I will share with you. Um, so this is now from the other end of the world, uh, from the continent of Australia. Uh, that's where I used to work in the year 2000. Uh, no, I started working there in 1997, and uh, I looked after the Aboriginal program in in the in, da in Darwin and in the top end of Australia. But next to next to Australia, you've got in the big country of Indonesia, and uh, Indonesia has a lot of islands, and one of the islands is East Timor, which for the past 400 and uh, 25 years was uh, first under the Portuguese and then under Indonesia and then was involved in the Second World War. Uh, but in 1999, they voted in a referendum for independence. And uh, in the year 2000, they were granted independence and the Indonesian militia came in and destroyed the country before leaving. Uh, so the Australian, uh, after, uh, after UN Security Council uh, resolution, the Australians sent the first peacekeeping force to uh, Timor to try and restore a law and order there. And that was really uh, when the whole program sort of started because I then uh, saw my first person from East Timor in Darwin. Uh, they came, there were about 5,000 refugees. And uh, the people from the WHO office in New Delhi uh, used to come through Darwin and they asked me whether I would go there and start helping them out. And really, remember that when there's war, everything comes to a standstill. You can't have a war going on and cataract surgery is still going on. Everything comes to a standstill. So a lot of routine tasks get stopped. And uh, so we went there in, July, in, in uh, April 2000 and uh, saw what was going on. It was like a war zone. Where everybody there carries a gun. Everybody's got a flag telling you which country he's from. And uh, we started then the first part of the program, which ran for four years, where we really picked up the, what, what needed to be done at that time. So that's a picture of the hospital. Um, that's the hospital there, and it was under the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, we signed an MOU with them. The MOU was one page, was the smallest MOU I've ever signed. It, two lines said, you, will come, you, you can come to the hospital, and uh, we will give you a place to work. And my part of it is, yes, I'll come to the hospital and I'll bring my team and we'll work. That was the MOU, how, how everything started. Uh, so we started in July 2000 and then would come three, four times a year. Uh, this is a kind of picture that you would see in a high volume hospital here, but we'd see seven, 800 patients every day and we'd do about 50 or 60 operations there. The first few times was always to do with the effects of the, of the dis disturbance, the violence, uh, as you see here, I don't have to explain uh, the effects of falling into a fire uh, or this man who was FAK glasses were held up with his shoelaces. But either way, soon we got down to uh, doing the routine stuff, cataract surgery being the biggest lot of them. Uh, and, and so it went on and on and on for the four years. And then after that, like you normally do, when you go up with friends, you run out of money. And so I said, fine, we've done our bit now, bye bye. But one person whom I met there was this gentleman. He was the uh, head of the United Nations there. Uh, his name was Sergio de Mello. And he said to me, no, you can't go away like this. You've got to now help this country build up to the next level. And I said, yeah, that's all very fine, but where's the money? And he said, well, you make a plan. We'll see what to do with the money, all well said. So I, I, this, this man here was then the president of East Timor. So I made a plan with him. I said, see, you come to Australia, I'll buy two tickets and we'll go to different states or different places and you give a lecture and I'll collect money and so then we can start the program. And he said, yes, okay. But uh, once uh, you, you invite a president of a country, then he doesn't come alone. He comes with his wife, he comes with his kids, he comes with his nanny and he comes with his media advisor and this and so I had 30 people coming. And I thought to myself, what have I got myself into? Uh, so I thought, you know, you've invited a president and now you're going to be stuffed. So I spoke to a friend of mine and he said to me, leave it with me. And I thought, oh, that's very nice when somebody says, leave it with me, which basically means don't bother, <laughs> I can't help you. But a few days later, I got a call from the prime minister's office and he said, uh, we hear that the president is coming. Uh, what's he coming for? I said, well, what business is it of yours? Why he's coming here, you know? 
He said, no, no, I need to know. I said, oh my God, I've got myself into more serious trouble now. So he said, no, is he coming to raise money? I said, yes. Why is he raising money? I said, for the I program. And he said, oh, we thought he was coming for political reasons. So this was John Howard, who was the president then. So he said, do you mind if we make it into a state visit? I said, what's a state visit? The state visit is where the government will take care of everything. I said, then who's going to raise the money? And he said, no, no, you'll get everything, and you can do what? He needs to come one day to meet the governor general. I said, oh, that's very good. So long and short of it is, I got the plane. Uh, we got the accommodation. We got the police. We got everything organized for five days. And I traveled in the prime minister's plane with the president. And in one week, we raised $750,000. So that's how we started the program off in, in, in East Timor. So you know, like. It, every program you say, well, what's, what's the end point going to be? So the end point was to produce a program, hand it over to the government and get out so that they would be able to run their own program in years to come. So we wanted to do a handover. So the first thing we did was to strengthen the primary eye care so we were able to train eye care nurses so that we could take the program out to the districts. Uh, it also meant that a lot of our own surgeons who were going there had to become proficient in small incision cataract surgery. And we learned that in places like Albi Prasad, we learned it in Nepal, we learned it in Madurai, uh, and we all came in. And so we all then switched from uh, FACO and extra cap to, to six, which was the right thing to do. And here are some of the nurses uh, uh, who, were, who were trained by us. And that way we were able to, able to start off clinics in all the other places. Uh, so that people didn't have to come to the capital, just like you'd normally run a program anywhere else. Uh, some of the places were difficult to reach. We would travel by helicopter. That's the United Nations helicopter. And uh, those were some of the facilities available there. But basically, the common factor was late presentation of disease. So we, we really had to put in a program where screening would happen. You'd pick up disease early, and you'd get better results. Uh, that's a melanoma of the choroid, by the way. Uh, uh, so that's how, that's how we went, but it's not only about cataract surgery, we did oculoplastics, uh, like this lady with an SCC. Uh, that's what the operating theaters then started looking like as we got new theaters in. Uh, the lady with a BCC, uh, and then repaired uh, one with a neurofibroma. But the way we were able to do it was to hire a doctor who represented the program who lived in the country, so that he would then, or they were all he's, but would then look after the training would look after the service delivery because you can't have training without service delivery. So we had to have a robust service delivery program which would then allow training to occur. So we had Girish in the upper left corner who was from Bangalore, Andreas who's uh, from Switzerland, and then this guy in the corner is Manoj who's from Nepal, but he's somewhere here. Uh, but after the first phase of training, what you see is that when they started doing their outreach, all the staff who were involved with the outreach were Timorese. There were no longer any expatriate staff. So we were able to sort that cadre of, uh, of workers out uh, so that they then became the foundation of the, of the program. And the surgery was quite the same as what you would do here. They'd come in and they'd have their surgery and go home. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I, it would be wrong for me to try and show you how we do six because you would tell me oh, everything that, was, that could be improved on this. But but really, that's the kind of surgery that we, that we were doing, uh, basic six, which is a very elegant, elegant sort of surgery. Anyway, I'll skip that because you know all this. Uh, but the issue is uh, we were able then to extend our program to 13 uh, areas within the country. But every program requires to have a headquarter. So in 2011, we opened the National Eye Center in Delhi, which is the capital. So you've got New Delhi, which is the capital of India, and Delhi, which is the capital of East Timor. Sometimes a bit confusing. But this was funded by the Australian government, and uh, so they made the building, and our program, which is the East Timor Eye program, actually put the building, put the, uh, equipped the whole thing, in addition to carrying on with manpower training. So that's what it looks like from inside. It's got a very modern, it's a small structure, but a very modern uh, sort of equipment and so on that we were able to, uh, do things that are normally done in any eye program. Uh, we got equipment from all over the world, uh, a lot of it from India, uh, because they are cheap, they are easy to use, easy to service, and they do the job. But then that's, that's one side of it. What about the manpower? That was our biggest problem, because Timor had no university, and, uh, and it was very difficult for us to find places for the students to be trained to do their ophthalmology. 
So the first thing we did was, uh, one of the hats I wear is I'm associated with the University of Sydney, and we made a program called the Diploma of International Ophthalmology. So this consists of uh, one component, which is your basic sciences component, which is done by remote learning. So you get a task, you get a CD, you get a resource, and then you do it, and then the module, and then you do your exam. Uh, so that's the foundation. The next level was how to use a slit lamp, how to use diagnostic equipment, and the man medical management of disease, which was done uh, both in country and then in Tasmania with me. Uh, then we came on to the surgical part of it. The surgical part was done, the initial steps were done in country with visiting teams that used to go there. And then for final training, we sent uh, Dr. Marcelino, who was the first ophthalmologist, we sent him to Nepal and to, uh, to LV Prasad uh, Eye Institute. So that's how we managed to get all the components of the training done. Then he also did a research thesis uh, so that he would be able to then you know, have all the components of being not only a doctor but also a communicator and health advocate and researcher that, uh, that an ophthalmologist is supposed to do. So in 2008, he got his degree from the University of Sydney and uh, he was awarded the Master of Medicine. Uh, so that's photographs of him uh, learning and, you know, uh, and then working in his own country. So for his training, we had input from a large number of countries. But then uh, the University of Timor-Leste was, uh, was uh, you know, actually came into being, and we then said, we, what we need now are we need cataract surgeons. So we instituted with the University of Timor a diploma in ophthalmology program, which was a 24-month program. And then we thought once we get them to be competent cataract surgeons and, and get their diploma, they could then go on and do their masters in other places because Timor is still too small. It has a population of only 12 lakhs. So you can't have a master's program for 12 lakh people. So what happened then is these people had their training in Cuba. They did their medicine after independence in Cuba. So they had to first go to Cuba and learn Spanish. So their national language is Portuguese. They normally, in school, they were taught Indonesian, Bahasa. They uh, speak at home in a language called Tetum. Then they go to Spain, uh, to, uh, to Cuba and learn Spanish. And then these guys from Australia come and say, we're going to talk to you in English. So uh, it, it was a little bit, of a little bit of an issue. So we, when we set up the program, the first six months was just to learn English and uh, work in the eye clinic. After that, then they went on to 18 months of, uh, of working in the clinic and learning to be cataract surgeons. But then again, the volume is not big enough, so for training of the small incision cataract surgery, which I believe is the mother of all surgeries, and also a basic oculoplastic surgery, we had to send them to Nepal. Why Nepal? Why not anywhere else? Because Nepal is the only country that will take somebody at that, in that phase of training. When they are not yet ophthalmologists, most other countries will take them as fellows. But Nepal will take them one step earlier which is why we've had some, we've got a good relationship with them, and they do courses for us training our uh, people in, in cataract surgery. So all the Australian doctors and all the doctors from other countries who were coming there, really, now that we had cataract surgeons, we, they didn't need to go and do cataract surgery in the districts. So they all became teachers because they were all subspecialists in their own right. And so we devised a curriculum uh, earlier on, and each person was given a a topic, a time, so that they followed the curriculum. And all these people pay their own way, they buy their own tickets, they come and stay there, they spend a week, uh, practice their subspeciality, do their teaching, and then go back. These are some of the Timorese registrars in, in action. Uh, a lot of teaching is done on site. There are the room with four slit lamps, and everybody is examining patients, and then they'll call you and say, come, let, can we discuss this? So, and then everybody comes there, and we discuss a case. And that's, uh, that's the practical side. That's theater. Uh, uh, two tables running together, and uh, I just go and hang around until somebody wants something for me. They're, they're very competent people. They, they learn on their own. Uh, we also have subspeciality clinics run by subspecialists. Uh, we have a, from July, from 2009, we've been doing colonial transplantation there. Uh, now that's Michael Bellin sitting, who's uh, one of the colonial gurus, and the Timorese are operating and doing colonial grafting. Uh, we also have others who come in and teach their subjects. That's a view of the theater. 
uh, vitro retinal surgery going on, uh, and, and so on. So these are just snapshots of hands-on training that goes on when, when the visiting teams come. And we have 26 visitors every year. So every two weeks, there's, there's, there's a teacher coming. And they come year after year after year. So it's the same fellow coming and teaching the same subject. Uh, <coughs> these are the registrars. And the thing is, uh, the registrars then step in to do other roles. For example, this girl here is a registrar. There was no nurse to assist me, so she came and scrubbed up. So they see all aspects of being and providing ophthalmic services. We also have five uh, centers connected with telemedicine so that anybody there can connect with anywhere in the world and ask for an opinion. Uh, we can go on. So these are some of the photographs supplied through telemedicine, and it's quite... Uh, it's quite difficult to manage these conditions, but you can see why they need to get a second opinion. Uh, that's them at their graduation when they were the first batch of uh, students and when they got their diploma, the three of them. Uh, these two girls are in, in uh, Nepal right now and I just got funding for him yesterday to go to Nepal. And that's after their diploma, they go and do their masters. And when they go there, they've got a head start because they can do cataract surgery. They already know a lot of things. Uh, that's them at the Lumbini Eye Institute in Nepal, and that's a view of uh, the theater in Lumbini. The thing is, it's high volume there, but when they come back to their country, they're not going to need such high volume, but we need to send them to a high volume place so that they can get enough exposure, enough experience, and then they, they, come, they come back. And also then they, they start with their own relationships with their own people so that in future they would continue with that. Uh, these are some of our classmates from India. Uh, Nepalese classmates who then help us uh, with our training. To finish off, we, it's all very nice to do all this, but what about our own trainees from Australia? How, when we move on and, you know, we need to introduce our younger colleagues to programs like this so that they would then carry on the relationship between country one and country two. So from our practice, we set up a scholarship so that our uh, final year after they finish their exams, could go and do a fellowship in East Timor. Uh, so they would come to one of the Indian institutions and learn uh, small incision surgery so that they could uh, go to Timor and, and operate there and work with their colleagues. They go there because they see things they'll never see again in their life. Uh, and there's a whole ring of uh, people. And we've opened the scholarship now to, to international. So we have people from Switzerland coming and, uh, and also from Australia. So it's really a big. Uh, open scholarship, you can write, and if you get selected, your, you know, your training is paid for, as well as uh, four or five months in Timor. But a lot of these younger people who went there have now had their families, they've started their practice, and now they are coming back as consultants in their own subspeciality. So we're really getting to take a back seat. Nursing uh, is also what we support. We also support optometry training. Uh, we also have training for people looking after those who've got very poor vision or no vision. We've also got uh, training for ocularists. So the program is really, and biomedical technicians, so the program is not really just a question of training ophthalmologists. It's a sort of a complete program to train all sorts of uh, ophthalmic professionals. We also carry out research, uh, which is related to answering prob uh, questions, how, what's diabetes like here, what's glaucoma like here, and we publish that once we know. So at, in two years' time, we hope to hand over. I mean, 2020 is an auspicious year. Uh, and we recently had a meeting with the health minister, and I explained to him that this is what really you, you should be doing. It's not constructing five-year plans, but you should be constructing 30-year plans so that you can budget for it. Because every five years, really five years, nothing happens in a country's eye program. Uh, other countries in the region have followed this model. It's called the Timor model. So Western Samoa, Micronesia, you don't even know where Micronesia is, but it's there. And it's got only one ophthalmologist, but they followed the Timor model, and now they're self-sufficient uh, in, uh, in their ophthalmic manpower. So really, we've been involved with all aspects of uh, the eye program. We, these are the younger generation who will take over from who are there now. Uh, it's the full package that's being trained. Uh, the complete eye force. We also have, uh, over these years, eradicated vitamin A deficiency. The blindness, which was 7.7%, has now come down to 2.8%. Uh, still a lot of work to be done. 
Funding is always a problem. Where do you get the money from? But our, the strength of this program is that the individuals who are part of the program fund it. That's the team from the uh, eye center in Delhi. Uh, and the logos show you where all there's been an input for running this program in East Timor. That's, the, that's why I said this is where the whole world chips in to, to get uh, things going. So thank you, and uh, as I said, it's not an ICO thing as yet, but I'm sure that it will be. There will, there's a lot of role for the ICO now to come and standardize things and, and uh, guide it further so that the Timorese can run it themselves. Thank you. of last year, but once it has run another year, it will become an essential part of the program. Rebecca. Is my the microphone working? Oh, yeah, there. Uh. Okay, so... Um, I'd like to talk a bit about shorter term um, missions, shorter term trips, and how we can achieve something in a, sh in a short time. Because many of us are working full time in our own practices. We only have a little bit of time that we can spend going abroad and trying to make an impact. Um, so I'm going to just go over some of my experiences, talking and contrasting three different case studies, um, and talk about what I've learned during what I've been doing. So. I'm an oculoplastic surgeon back home. Um, I run a busy orbital referral service, but I'm also um, a, a, t a travel addict. I uh, love traveling around 45 different countries, but I'm also an educationalist. So I, I've studied education and done a, a master's and uh, wanted to get involved in education around the world. So thinking about why we volunteer to go on these um, short-term trips, it's nice to think that we're all altruistic. I think most of us going into medicine probably uh, do want to do it for the benefit of others. Um, and in going abroad, we can try and use our skills to help those with more limited healthcare resources and also those with fewer training resources. Um, we may also develop ourselves, so, that, so we may be able to acquire some personal development during these trips. So we can gain experience in teaching and training in different places. Um, it helps to combat burnout when we're doing the same things all day, every day back home. Um, we, it exposes us to different healthcare systems and cultures, so we might learn something that we can bring back. Um, then slightly less, slightly less um, altruistic motivations, uh, we get travel experience. We might experience rarer cases that we haven't seen elsewhere and maybe surgical practice of rarer cases. But some of those, I think we have to examine our own motivations for why we're doing it. Um, we may also be motivated by a specific invitational purpose um, if there's a, a locally identified need or perhaps we've been invited by fellow clinicians and societies. So when I first set out to do some volunteering abroad, I think I had a slightly naive model in my mind thinking we would just go, uh, we would be visiting doctors or specialists, we would treat some patients and everybody would benefit and it would be great. I think. What I didn't realize initially, though, is, is how much medical care does not occur in isolation. Um, there's many more things to think about. So social attitudes, there may be different attitudes to what we're used to in our home countries. Um, traditional versus modern health care. Uh, there, there may be uh, traditional systems of medicine, and people may have a distrust of our Western or local medical practices. Um, and various social practices may have an impact on patient health. Um, there, there, are, there may be multiple different non-government organizations working in a region, um, and it, there may be difficulties in getting funding, there may be competition for funding, and there may be good or bad interactions with other groups in the area. 
the government of the countries that we're going to may support us, or in some cases they may block, they may, want, they may not wish outside aid. Um, they may have their own agenda, and um, particularly in some areas that they may lack an effective public health policy. So um, if you're going in to try and do some short-term volunteering, the, the amount of impact that you can make like, may be, be limited by the local public health uh, policies. The local doctors may not open, may not welcome us with open arms. Sometimes they they would love the training. Sometimes they welcome the help, but sometimes they might feel threatened by the visitors coming from overseas. Threat of uh, taking their practice, taking their their um, funding. As I've said, there may be traditional healthcare practices that may be preferred by patients and trusted by even by doctors, but which may actually be ineffective or harmful. Um, and the country itself may not be stable, so some places have a lack of infrastructure, like Claire said in Uganda, difficulty physically getting the patients to come to the clinics. There may be a lot of corruption uh, that means that healthcare resources are spent ba and allocated badly, and there may be war. So my first case study is uh, a trip I uh, made to Cambodia, which is a country in which there's 180,000 blind people, uh, most of which is avoidable or at least treatable, and 75% of that is from cataract. So most of the population is very poor and there's very few ophthalmologists, particularly because there's this missing generation after the Khmer Rouge genocide, a lot of intellectuals were murdered and they're only just starting to build up their own population of doctors. So I went as a group of visiting surgeons just for a week um, and we were aiming to provide mainly cataract surgery. There was strong government support. The Secretary of State was involved in the implementation of this program was, and was on the ground at the time. And we were located in a local hospital in Phnom Penh. Um, equipment was all donated from around the world, particularly Australia, um, and the surgeons visiting were self-funded. So the, it, this is a model of us sort of parachuting in to try and help a, a needy area that's very under-resourced with doctors. Um, so what was good about this trip, that patients were pre-screened in the community prior to us trying to see them. So we only had a week, we made the most of it to try and do surgery with that week and we had uh, medical students and other lo local volunteers out pre-screening the patients before we arrived. Uh, so about a thousand patients had already been assessed in the community um, and given bus tickets to come to the hospital if they'd been identified as having a remedial problem. We used medical students as translators, so they gained something and learned from us, um, and did about 250 surgeries in a week. There was great team spirit, lots of uh, enthusiasm, and the, the hospital facilities um, that were basically, I think, l rented from the local hospital were pretty good. So this is the theater there. Um, so what could have been better was Perhaps the team composition, there was a lot of enthusiasm to all come and help, but um, there was a sort of mass invite of, of UK and Australian doctors, um, and we ended up with a team of 10 doctors, but didn't think, no, there were no nurses brought with us, and we found that we couldn't use local scrub nurses. Uh, there was also a bit of lack of preparation, so a lot of us arrived not really knowing what to expect. And for one individual in particular, there was significant culture shock from our pediatric ophthalmologist who really became very overwhelmed of seeing so many blind children um, that she couldn't help because of the circumstances she found herself in. Um, also, we only brought one person with significant six experience uh, and having two FACO machines only, that meant that surgical capacity wasn't as good as it could have been. Uh, and we were unfamiliar with the equipment the people mainly doing the cataract surgery hadn't used the particular machines that we had before. There was also the group uh, dynamic, is, is, which was probably inevitable of traveling with a group of people that hadn't worked together before. But you may have seen this model of groups forming, then having to, to learn how to work together and only reaching a level of peak performance after a while of working together. Um, and we felt we were only just reaching that performing stage by the end of the week and it was time to go home. So one solution may to that may be to reform the group for further trips in years to come. So what else was less went less well? Even with this bus ticket scenario, lots of patients just deluged us who just heard by word of mouth that we were coming and we found it very difficult to um, keep to just treating the pe people who'd been pre-identified. 
and lots of chil children were brought in. It's understandable, but there was a certain amount of opinion shopping of patients who'd already been seen by previous doctors and told that unfortunately there was nothing that could be done. They all came back again for second opinions, and it actually used up quite a lot of time that we didn't really have. Uh, there was a certain amount of tension with the local ophthalmology team who were worried that we were taking, that we were taking patients from the city. It, we, the agreement was that we would take uh, rural patients who couldn't afford other treatments, uh, but the local doctors still seemed to be worried that we were taking funding from them, um, taking their, their paying patients from them. And there was a lack of interaction with other NGOs. There were sev there's several other ophthalmic NGOs working in Phnom Penh. Um, and to me, it seemed like the people running our group hadn't really corresponded with, with the others because, for example, I, as an oculoplastic surgeon, I did a, a, an evisceration for a, a child with a tumor in his eye uh, and was told that there were no implants available in Cambodia and no ocular prosthetics facilities. When I subsequently went, met one of the doctors from the next door hospital, they told me, oh yeah, no, there is. There's another charitable hospital that has those resources, but we just didn't know about it. And the pharmacy situation, that there was no pharmacy available to us and that we, we um, brought some of our own post-op medication, but we weren't really aware that we weren't going to be able to pre prescribe medicine in the way that we hoped. So surgical outcomes, uh, again, what went less well is it was difficult to fake her without having trained scrub nurses with us, so we'll bring them next time. Unfamiliarity with dense cataracts for some of the surgeons who came, and it led to a high PC tear rate that would have been quite frankly unacceptable at home. Um, so it, it was also difficult to follow up the patients, so if they had a complication, they had to wait until the next group was coming a month or so later. And there was poor record keeping, so, so it was d difficult to to have medical records and be sure that the, pa the, the next group coming would know what had happened to those previous patients. Um, the roles weren't always clearly identified. That when, when I arrived, I didn't really know what was going to be expected of me, and we had, had a couple of us had to spend a couple of days sort of managing roles and who was going to do what. Uh, that could be improved. The patient flow was very bad, just with people queuing outside the hospital and, and trying, to, trying to work out who was coming where for what and we were sparsely equipped. So what can improve would be more balanced teams next time, that they're building their own premises, which will make life a lot easier and can help to control the patient flow. Trying to build some links with the local professionals. To, um, so because of the slight tension with them, they didn't allow any of their registrars to come for any training with us, which was a real lost opportunity and which we hope will improve for next time. And also to target some of the invites to make sure that every group brings a sufficient number of six trained surgeons. Um, I think returning teams to come who've worked together before and hopefully maybe to have electronic patient record and work towards more local training. So my second uh, briefer case study, uh, teaching oculoplastics in China. So th these trips are run th that I've been on are run by a charity called Lifeline Express, which I think works in India as well. Um, they have a model of strongly of training local surgeons to do cataracts. So they have four eye trains that travel around China training FACO surgery. They identify centers of need. The government then donates the, the cataract machines and the, tra the surgical trainers come on a train with the cataract equipment, train the locals how to do the, the cataract surgery and then leave, leaving a FACO machine behind for them to use. This has been very successful and is now totally su self-sufficient so that all the trainers are now Chinese. Um, and they've moved on to phase two for the visiting consultants, which means that we now just come purely to provide some training. Training and education, sorry, was that a question? No. Um, so I've been twice, firstly to Mianyang in Sichuan province and secondly to Yulin in Guangji, Guangxi. So basically this is following the philosophy of you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. So you come in and, and do surgery, you're only benefiting the patients that you do the surgery on at that time. Whereas if you teach somebody to do the surgery, they can then provide ongoing um, surgery in their country. So over a three-day trip each time, what we did was teaching, basically. We did lectures. Um, they, they gathered ophthalmologists from around the regions for us to do some lectures for. We ran discussion groups, case pres got the local juniors to do case presentations. We did videos. We had clinic-based teaching and surgical teaching. Um, and one of the good things about this was engaging engaging people in new teaching methods. I think partly because of the communist system in China and the very, very hierarchical system, um, 
trainees were not used to asking questions, involving themselves in discussion groups and uh, really interacting. So, so some of these interactive teaching sessions were great. Oh, time out. <laughs> uh, shall I wrap up? Uh, uh, okay. So, yeah, what I really wanted to do was compare and contrast some of these trips with what we've done in Indonesia, which was to run a training the trainers program. So the third case study I was going to give an example of was um, going somewhere where really they needed um, support in learning how to, to facilitate training throughout their country. Um, moving on to the phil philosophy of not just teaching somebody to, to perform surgery, but to teach the locals how to teach people around their region and this ca concept of cascading out the training. Um, so we did a project running a three-day training the trainers course in Indonesia twice based on a model that the College of Ophthalmologists of the UK had done in Africa. Um, I, I don't have time to go through all of it, um, but basically it, it, it had really good impact of trying to, to help the, the local trainees and, uh, the, and the local, sorry, the local trainers um, to get involved with some more modern teaching methods and basically improve their training locally. Um, okay, so I, I think I haven't got time for all of this, unfortunately. Um, so what I was going to conclude in terms of what I've learned from these trips is that um, firstly, preparation is key. If you're going to go for a short time, you need to be as impactful as possible. Um, you need to bring the right team with the right equipment to do the right job. You need to have local engagement if you're going to make any ongoing um, impact and you need to train towards local sustainability rather than just, just promoting a sort of volunteerism. Thank you. No, Dr. Grover, A.K. Grover. So I'm sp supposed to speak to you on continuing medical education in the life of an ophthalmologist. So I, I have a few slides, but I'll just run over them because I have one minute to speak on and one minute to wrap up. And... Uh, I'll just run through those slides. So um, change, as we know, is the only constant, whether for the better or for the worse. And uh, most of you are familiar with this, except Claire, maybe. <laughs> Kumkarn was a sleeping a demon who used to sleep for six months and then wake up for six months. So if he, he was an ophthalmologist, he wouldn't be able to work. Six months is a long period for changes to take place. So uh, we, I was supposed to talk about what, why, how, and who of continuing education. So I'll summarize it by saying that it is all about m giving medical knowledge, skills, and attitudes after the period of your graduation and post-graduation. But today we recognize that it is a pro continuous, continuing professional development, which must also include managerial, ethical, or professionalism social, including team building and teaching, and personal skills, including communications um, and ability to get along. So that brings us to this definition of being able to work and practice safely, effectively, and legally. And therefore, each one must have an individual uh, pace of CPD based on reflecting on what they need, and they accordingly develop a new a plan for them and which changes the physician behavior to give better outcomes to the patients. And uh, they have become necessary because of increased expectations, complex healthcare systems, and rapid change in technology. But there are a number of barriers to developing this, least of uh, them not being the funding part of it and having the appropriate plans. 
these should all be effective interventions with clear defined goals which should be measurable so they must be evaluated to see whether they are working and this should be there should be a participant perspective of what cpd should mean which will depend on what he wants to learn which is based on auditing his own results and the providers should find interactive techniques rather than lectures and the new social media work better and these must be measured to see whether they are bringing about the behavioral changes and the changes that the objectives that the learner wanted to have and these should be con conducted both by societies such as our all india ophthalmic society and the colleges like uh, the colleges in uk and uh, in new zealand australia with ransco which uh, they were talking about and finally to say that ico has a very active role in cpd and they have a full committee devoted to cpd with representative from ico members and all other societies which has a number of resources on its website and there is a visiting professor program that it is running thank you very much i think i took two and a half minutes sorry for that extra half minute and thank you very much for dr arvind claire and uh, all rebecca for being here and uh, yes and nitin of course nitin is our own man we don't consider him a guest so <laughs> thank you all for being here and it was uh, i hope um, a session which uh, met your requirements we also wanted to speak a bit about exams did we speak about them and the um, um, can, I, can i just say that i think we don't have time to do the formal presentation on exams but we have a booth here um, it's in the hall pc18 in the halls in the trade center and we'd be really happy for anyone who's interested in ico exams which i hope you all are to come along and we'll answer absolutely all the questions you may have because I think we've run out of time in this session. But also, I can put my laptop up and uh, show you there. And that should work nicely. Thank you very much. <laughs>